ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to present Mr. Sam Blumenfeld. Thank you, Marjorie, very much for that very kind introduction. I'm delighted to be here and, and, and really uh, awestruck by the size of the audience tonight, and which attests to the power of television, uh, which reminds me of a show that I was on in Chattanooga. I was uh, on a um, morning, one of these very early morning shows with the, with the uh, president-elect of the Tennessee Education Association. I, it was a sort of a gentle debate between the two of us. And uh, he finally had to admit that he was sending his own son to a private school. <laughs> and of course, the hostess of the show asked why, and he said, well, he was concerned about the quality of education. <laughs> so they, they do know what they're they do know what's going on in the schools. The, uh, the public schools are for those who are not smart enough to know how badly uh, they're being ripped off. Uh, but anyone who knows better certainly is uh, aware of what's going on to some degree. What I'm going to do tonight is really combine the contents uh, of two lectures that I give, one on the NEA and one on the moral disintegration of public education. And I'm sure you'll see the connection. Uh, uh, between those two subjects. First, the NEA. The NEA is really a political organization. We make a big mistake when we think of it as an educational organization. Uh, its main thrust now, its main interest is political. You can't hear? Shall I bring this? I'll have to practically kiss it, but that's the only way I can. All right, let me. The um, NEA is basically a political organization rather than an educational one. As a matter of fact, I, I would consider education to be the pretext for what for their political activity. Their agenda is political. Their goals are political. What they want to do is is uh, is uh, change America. To give you an idea of how political they are and how how concerned they are with political power, let me. Uh, quote some of the NEA uh, top uh, people. In 1967, NEA Executive Secretary Sam Lambert proclaimed, NEA will become a political power second to no other special interest group. NEA will organize this profession from top to bottom into logical operational units that can move swiftly and effectively and with power unmatched by any other organized group in the nation. In November 1969, the NEA's monthly magazine, Today's Education, boldly stated, the NEA is not content to wait for something to happen. It is making things happen. The profession now has massive resources at its command. The job ahead is one of mobilizing and directing these resources with precision and purpose. And in 1974, NEA President Helen Wise said, teachers individually and collectively can change the direction of government. I didn't know that that's what teachers are supposed to be doing, changing the direction of government. I had assumed that uh, the purpose of teachers is to, or, or of teachers is to transfer the values and knowledge uh, of one generation to the next generation. We should at least expect that much from teachers. But apparently, they're more concerned with changing the direction of government than of teaching. And of course, in what direction does the NEA want to change it? Leftward? In fact, the NEA makes no secret of what it wants. You can read their entire blueprint for social and political change given in great detail each year in the form of resolutions adopted at their annual convention. In many respects, it resembles the platform of a political party. For these resolutions become legislative proposals to be pushed by the NEA's national and state lobbies. But since the enactment of legislation depends on getting legislators to vote the way you want them to vote, the NEA now concentrates its efforts on getting their puppets 
elected. For all practical purposes, the NEA might as well be considered America's third political party, far more efficient and better organized and financed than either of the two major parties and, and far more radical. The NEA has its platform. It has its organized political units in every school district in the nation and in every state capital. It has its paid pro professional operatives, besides having paid lobbyists in Washington and in every state capital of the Union. They have an army of 1,170 organizers, professional organizers known as UNISERV, who travel around the country doing nothing but organizing teachers into action groups, either for the Union or for political purposes. Many teachers have undergone such intensive political training that they now know more about party politics than academics. The Reader's Digest of May 1984 called that army of UNISERV uh, professionals the largest grassroots political army ever deployed in the United States. There are now more teachers in the Michigan legislature than lawyers, and I might also add more in the Oregon legislatures, the Washington legislature. legislature. Wherever I seem to go, I, I'm told that the NEA has more influence in that state legislature than any other group. Teachers in unprecedented numbers are running for state office and school boards. The largest single profession represented among delegates to the Democratic National Convention was that of teachers. And most state legislatures in America are either controlled by the NEA state affiliates or are in danger of falling under such control. Now, the reason why I wrote this book was because having become aware of the NEA's incredible power, and particularly their, their, their drive for political power, I realized that conservatives knew very little about the NEA or what it was up to. And I, I, it, it became obvious to me that if the conservatives did not factor into their strategy what the NEA was doing, that we would lose many elections. And I think this last election proved the point very well. President Reagan, as you know, won very handily by a, by a rather comfortable margin, while co in Congress the coattail effects never really uh, happened. Uh, very few additional conservatives were elected to the Congress. And in many state legislatures, I would venture to say that the NEA probably gained seats. So in Congress and on local levels, we did not pick up the, the, uh, uh, the, the seats we expected. And, that, and I believe that is because we simply did not factor in the NEA's activities, their local activities, uh, in the political equation. Uh, I wrote the book as quickly as I could to, to perhaps have an impact on this last election, but uh, by the time it was published, the plans of the candidates had already been made, and it was really impossible for it to have an impact. I think, though, however, uh, perhaps we can have an impact in the 1986 election. But the interesting thing is that the NEA uh, has done its homework. They have a strategy to defeat us. That's the interesting thing. They've been working on it for quite a number of years. In fact, they are convinced that the only group in America, the only force in America that prevents them from attaining their, the total power they want is the so-called new right, particularly the new religious right. And so they have worked out a strategy to defeat the new right. And they, they, uh, they've even uh, held meetings, a training program. They had a training program developed by the Western States Regional Staff of the National Education Association, a training program entitled Combating the New Right. Here it is. I got hold of it. And here is the participant's manual. Now, in that manual, they list, of course, all of these horrible uh, New Right organizations that are to be defeated. And you'll probably be interested to know that the, the organizations they don't like are uh, groups like the Committee for Survival of a Free Congress, the uh, National Conservative Political Action Committee, the Conservative Cor Caucus, American Conservative Union, uh, Citizens Committee for the Right to Keep and Bear Arms. That's one of their, on their enemies list. Gun Owners of America, 
Young Americans for Freedom, Moral Majority, uh, Religious Roundtable, Californians for Biblical Morality. They don't particularly care for Biblical morality, as you know. Uh, the National Right to Work Committee, uh, the uh, Council for a Union-Free Environment, I'm all for that. The uh, National Association of Professional Educators, which is a, a rival group in Washington, competitive group. They are against the National Taxpayers Union, tax reform immediately, your trim committees. Uh, the American Tax Reduction Movement, that's the Howard Jarvis uh, organization. They are against national, the National Tax Limitation Committee. Why? Because they want unlimited taxation. As a matter of fact, they have a lien on your private property. You don't even own your property. Schools have a lien on it. You just try to stop paying your tax and see where you land. You're off your property and it'll be auctioned off or sold to some other tenant. Uh, they're against the Heritage Foundation, the Center for the Defense of Free Enterprise. They, 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 they describe that organization as promotes Americanism and free enterprise. <laughs> that makes it a no-no. <laughs> Opposes government regulation, publishes a newsletter, the private sector. And they are against the uh, uh, Institute for Free Enterprise, which they describe uh, uh, as follows, develops economics curriculum for teachers and students owned by Amway Corporation, <laughs> advocates laissez-faire economics unfettered by governmental and union influence. They are against the Hoover Institution, the National Schools Committee for Economic Education, which is a very benign organization. I've, I have visited them. I've, I've, I, I've met the, the head of that organization, and they, they describe it quite accurately. They say, develops economics education materials, materials promoting free enterprise in the American way. Now, why is that on their enemies list? And they are against the uh, Lincoln Institute for Research and Education, which is a, a conservative black organization. They're against the Western Goals, which was founded by Larry McDonald, the, uh, the uh, congressman who was killed on, on the Korean airline, uh, 007. And they are against the Coalition for Peace Through Strength, because they're for a nuclear freeze. They're against the American Security Council. They're even against Parents of Minnesota. <laughs> That's an organization that opposes secular humanism and values education. They're against citizens for decency through law. They're against the Institute for Creation Research, the John Birch Society, American Opinion Bookstores, uh, the U.S. Coalition for Life, the National Pro-Life Political Action Committee, the National Association for Neighborhood Schools, which is one of the organizations sponsoring uh, the talk tonight. And they are against the uh, John Birch Society, the uh, Church League of America, Accuracy in Media, and, and a couple of other organizations, Pro-Family Forum, etc. In other words, they've done their homework. They have worked very hard to assemble information about us, but we haven't assembled much information about them, and that's why I wrote the book, so you will see that, that we've got to begin to factor in the NEA as a political force because they really are America's third political party. You see, the, the socialists in this country cannot hope to achieve power via the Socialist Party or the Communist Party. They can only do it through one of the major parties, and the party of choice is the Democratic Party, because the, Demo because the teachers, the NEA has its, is probably the largest single influential group within the Democratic Party. So all of your leftists have converged their energies into the NEA. The NEA is now becoming the vehicle for the radical left in this country. Many of your 60s radicals have went into the teaching profession. I mean, no, they no longer have to demonstrate in the streets. All they have to do is become delegates to the Democratic National Convention through the NEA. And of course, they do their work in the classroom as well. 
But the teachers have become the battering ram of the left in this country. And they are waiting out the Reagan administration because they consider Ronald Reagan to be a temporary aberration. They're not terribly, they are worried about, about us, but they have confidence that they can win. You know why? They control the future. They control 85% of the children's minds in this country. What would you think of the future of communism in Russia if the Russian school system was controlled by capitalists? Well, how can you have confidence in the future of American uh, free enterprise and of freedom when all of most of our children are under the control of these socialists and secular humanists and atheists right. who want to change this country into a socialist society? Now, the NEA is equally dangerous because of the philosophy of secular humanism. The philosophy of secular humanism holds that there is no such thing as unalienable rights. You see, our Declaration of Independence states quite clearly that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The Declaration further states that the purpose of government is to defend those unalienable rights, to permit the citizens to exercise those unalienable rights. The purpose of government is not to take away your unalienable rights, to prevent you from exercising them. On the contrary, the sole purpose of government is to make sure that you can exercise your unalienable rights. Well, now, since unalienable rights come to us from a creator, from God, well, if you don't believe in God, then you can't believe in unalienable rights. You can only believe in rights that the state gives you, privileges that the state gives you, not rights that are unalienable. Now, what is an unalienable right? It's a right that really cannot be taken away from you. If it is taken away from you, that is illegal. But yet our unalienable rights are being taken away from us by you know left and right. For example, in... in uh, Nebraska, the State Department of Education and the courts closed a Christian school because it would not accept certified teachers and would not accept a state-approved curriculum. I'm sure you've heard about the case. That's Reverend uh, Sullivan and the Faith Baptist School in uh, Louisville, Nebraska. Small school, small church. You would hardly think that the state would worry about a tiny school like that. But why did they worry about it? Why did they decide to crack down? Well, you see, all of the other Christian schools in the state, with the exception of just maybe a few, all of the other schools at the, in the state, Christian schools, had supinely accepted certified teachers and an approved curriculum. They had virtually stated that they no longer believed in unalienable rights. They were cashing in their unalienable rights. They were more concerned with pleasing the state school authorities than pleasing Jesus Christ. That's the problem with the Christians in, in Nebraska. They would rather seek the approval of the state than the approval of their God. So they caved in. I don't even think they caved in. I think they did it gladly. And they were quite angry over Reverend Sullivan, who stood up and would not accept certified teachers and would not accept uh, a state-approved uh, curriculum. Reverend Sullivan believes in unalienable rights. I guess he's quaint and old-fashioned. But he believes in religious freedom. He believes that it's an unalienable right and not a privilege as it is in the Soviet Union. But you see, that's what, that's what the secular humanists are trying to do in America. They're trying to get Americans to accept the fact that there are no such things as unalienable rights. There are only rights and privileges given to you by the state. And they've gotten, unfortunately, the concurrence and the agreement of most Christians. That's the horrible tragedy. We don't need the Soviet army to take our freedoms away from us. The Christians are giving them away without a fight. That's the problem in America. If the Christians would stand up for their rights, their unalienable rights, this thing would have been over a long time ago. We could restore freedom in America because Christians make up the vast majority of people. But somehow they've been brainwashed to believe that the, you know, they've got to bow down to the authority, any authority. 
Now, the Bible talks about giving Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but who is Caesar in the United States? Caesar is we the people. Caesar is the Constitution. That's to be obeyed, the Constitution. And when a state or, or educators uh, reject the Constitution and deny the Constitution, defile the Constitution, you are not to obey them. You better know who Caesar is before you decide to bow down to Caesar. You don't bow down to any authority that's around. But in any case, that's the problem that we are confronted with. And if the secular humanists win, of course, then of course our freedoms are lost because I don't believe there's ever been a, an atheist society in history that's ever been a free society. As a matter of fact, we have very good examples of atheist societies in the world today. Soviet Union, officially atheistic. Albania, officially atheistic. China, officially atheistic. Athe uh, atheistic societies become the most brutalized, horrible hells on earth. We have the freest society that has ever, uh, that has ever existed. And how did we get it? We got it from the Puritans. We got it from very strong believers in God. This entire nation is based on Scripture. Our, our founding documents are based on Scripture. Our form of government is based on Calvin's view of human nature, that man was innately depraved and not to be trusted with power. That's why our Constitution, our form of government, broke up power into as many small little pieces as possible. And so we're, in this country, we don't have to be afraid of one big Hitler taking over. But the problem is that we now have so many people working for the government in these bureaucracies that we have thousands and thousands of little Hitlers all over the place. That's our problem. We've got all these little Hitlers trying to run our lives. And until we reduce the size of government and get rid of all of that, uh, all of these little Hitlers, we're going to have lots of problems in the next few years because each one of these little Hitlers sings that song, If I Ruled the World. Do you ever hear that song? If I Ruled the World. <laughs> well, they're all singing it. And they want to rule the world so in their own little fashion, in their own little place. But that's the problem with the NEA. So it's more than just education. It's our entire way of life that they are tampering with. And when they say they want to change the direction of government, that's the direction they want to go into, the direction of socialist totalitarianism. Now, such unprecedented concentration of power makes the NEA the most politically dangerous organization in America. Its legislative agenda for 1984-85 covers every aspect of American life, from the Equal Rights Amendment to foreign policy in Central America, from abortion on demand to a nuclear freeze. Its stand on most issues is virtually identical with that of the radical left. And the communists are quite happy about it. In July 1981, Robert Moyer, a reporter for the Daily World, the official newspaper of the Communist Party USA made the following observations after attending the NEA convention. Quote, nowhere in the basic documents of NEA in their resolutions or new business items are there any anti-Soviet or anti-socialist positions. It seems unlikely that the path NEA is now taking will be reversed, unquote. To understand why the NEA is doing what it's doing, you have to know a little of its history. The NEA was founded in 1857, mainly by state education officers for the purpose of promoting uh, public education, government schooling, and, and the teaching profession. While the public schools were governed by the communities in their respective states, the educators thought of the system in national terms. Their ideal model was the highly centralized government-controlled Prussian school system with its Ministry of Education reflecting the strongly statist philosophy of Hegelianism. I don't have time to go into the details of Hegelianism, but I devote pretty much of a chapter uh, uh, to it in my book. Therefore, it ought not to surprise anyone that the call for a Department of Education with Cabinet status was made at the Association's very first 
organizational meeting. You see, since the Prussians had a Ministry of Education, they felt that we should have the same thing. And the Department of Education was going to be that, that kind of Ministry of Education, which would lay down national education policy. From 1857 to 1892, the NEA was little more than a glorified speech-making club for the educational elite. However, in 1892, the NEA began to assume the role of a U.S. Ministry of Education by creating committees and commissions to determine national education policy. Its most illustrious commission was that devoted to the reorganization of secondary education, which issued its famous cardinal principles in 1918. That report, which revolutionized the American high school, was the first major work of the progressives who had taken over the NEA a few years before it established its permanent headquarters in Washington, D.C. in 1917. Who are the progressives? They were a new breed of highly sophisticated educator, epitomized by John Dewey, trained in the new evolution-oriented humanist psychology developed in Germany by Wilhelm Wundt. These educator psychologists believed that socialism was the wave of the future and that the purpose of public education was to change America from a free enterprise individualist society to a socialist collectivist one. The NEA became the principal instrument whereby the progressives could organize and lead the teachers of America in the planned socialist direction. As early as 1932, in a book entitled Dare the School Build a New Social Order, Professor George S. Counts of Teachers College, Columbia, urged that the teachers should deliberately reach for power and then make the most of their conquest. But the progressives had to wait 30 years before American teachers in large numbers could be turned into political activists. In 1960, the AFL-CIO began its drive to organize white-collar public employees to make up for the decline in union membership in industry. The union leaders decided to start with teachers because they reasoned that, with, uh, that success with teachers would convince other white-collar workers to organize. If you could organize teachers, you know, who would uh, say no, secretaries and all the rest of them? It was this challenge from organized labor which transformed the NEA into, uh, from a professional organization into a union. Unionization loosened the restraints that professionalism had placed on political activism. By the mid-1970s, the NEA had become the most militant, politically partisan labor organization in America. Jimmy Carter credits the NEA with getting him elected in 1976, and as you will recall, that election was extremely close. Now, the interesting part about the unionization of public employees is that it was the campaign in New York by the AFL-CIO to organize the teachers there and the success of that campaign that then prompted President Kennedy to sign his order permitting the unionization of federal employees. Once that was done, then the states followed suit, and you had the unionization of public employees all across the country. And to my mind, this has been one of the most dangerous developments in American history, in our political history, because prior to that, it was considered a privilege to work for the government. I remember when I was growing up, the thought of having a government job was considered, wow, that was the end all and be all if you worked for the government and had, you know, security. If you wanted security, you got a government job, and everyone considered it a wonderful thing. Well, now, as the, as the public employees have become unionized, their allegiance, their loyalty is no longer toward the government that has hired them, or the taxpayers who pay their salaries. Their allegiance is now to the union. And all you have to do is read the publications of these public employees unions to see how militant they have become and how confrontational they are now with the very government that has hired them. They no longer consider themselves public servants. They're too good to be public servants. They want to be the public's master. They want to control you because you pay their salary. And, that's, and the only way that they can increase their salary is by increasing taxes. And how can they increase taxes? 
by controlling the legislatures. So now their whole aim is to control legislatures, to control politicians, to control your representatives so that they can tax you to the limit, to the hilt. And I believe that that's a very dangerous turn of events when the public servant becomes the public's master. But that's another reason why this whole development is so dangerous to our freedoms. Well, the NEA, of course, as you know, is a, is a, um, is a secular hum uh, humanist organization. They believe in secular humanism. And this, of course, has had its impact on the curriculum of our schools. And perhaps the most disastrous or the most tragic symptom of what is happening to American youngsters in the public schools is the incredible increase in teenage suicide. I'm sure that many of you are aware of this increase in suicide and uh, are worried about it. I know wherever I go I hear stories about young Americans committing suicide. And now they're committing suicide by the thousands. By the thousands, young Americans growing up in the 1980s in this great affluent country. And you wonder, what is so terrible? Why are they killing themselves? I mean, they've got cars. They've got stereos. They've got uh, video games. They've got designer jeans. They've got Big Macs. 57 flavors of ice cream. Trips to Disney World. Ski trips to Europe. Many high school kids nowadays go to Europe on their winter vacations. They take ski trips to northern Italy, to Switzerland. They've got everything that any, anyone who ever lived would have wanted. They're the most fortunate generation in history. Why are they killing themselves? Well, perhaps we can find a clue from one of the youngsters who committed himself in a very dramatic way. This is a, a story which appeared in Education Week of February 6th of this year. And the story is as follows. Well, the headline, let me read the headline. Texas teenager commits suicide on school stage. The story is as follows. An Arlington, Texas high school senior who was scheduled to play the lead part in the school play walked onto a classroom stage and shot himself with a sawed-off shotgun. The student's dramatic death follows a cluster of six youth suicides in the past year in the nearby city of Plano. That's a, a suburb of Dallas. James Staley, 17, remembered as a good student with normal adolescent problems, climbed up on the stage on January 18th and began asking heavy philosophical questions about the meaning of life, said James Willett, an Arlington police spokesman. There were only five or six students in the class and a teacher. No one took him seriously, and they gave him half-hearted and somewhat whimsical answers. The boy then sat down on a bar stool on the stage, opened a briefcase, and shot himself once in the head with the shotgun. He died instantly. Police said there were no signs of drug or alcohol use. No suicide note was found. Well, here was a youngster who was literally dying to know the meaning of life. And in the public school, they don't tell you such things. They don't understand what the meaning of life is. Oh, the secular humanist, some humanist teacher will say, well, the meaning of life is self-actualization. <laughs> Whatever that means, you figure it out. How do you self-actualize yourself? <laughs> but if that poor youngster had asked me what the meaning of life is, I would have said, to glorify God, you know. That's simple enough, you know. And maybe if he didn't understand it, it would have been enough to stop him. And he would have asked some questions. What does it mean to glorify God? Is there a God? But uh, this youngster was one of the many, and I believe that's one of the reasons why they are committing suicide. You see, they're told in schools that they are animals, that they are the products of evolution that they are products of the primordial ooze and that the purpose of their life is not much different than the purpose of an animal's life, you know. But human beings demand much more. Human beings are 
spiritual beings. They have a spiritual hunger, and if you deny it, as the schools do, although the schools aren't denying it entirely, what they're trying to do is, is, is nurture that, that hunger with paganism, with pagan practices, with cultism. But when youths have a, a yearning to know God and they are denied that, then they become nihilists, they become depressed, they become punk rockers, this, this, this depression takes on all, all forms. But there is also something else going on in the schools, which most people are not aware of, that I believe has a direct bearing on the incredible increase in suicide. And that is the teaching of something called death education. Now, how many people in this room have ever heard of death education? All right, I see your, um, many of you are knowledgeable about it. But for those who don't know what death education is, let me read to you um, a questionnaire, a death education questionnaire that was given out to students at a junior high school, a junior high school in Shakopee, Minnesota. They were asked such questions as, how often do you think about your own death? Has there been a time in your life when you wanted to die? If you had a choice, what kind of death would you prefer? Based on your present feelings, what is the probability of your taking your own life in the near future? How often have you seriously contemplated committing suicide? Suppose you were to commit suicide, what method would you be most likely to use? The methods listed in the questionnaire were barbiturates or pills, gunshot, hanging, drowning, jumping, cutting or stabbing, carbon monoxide, or other specify. I imagine some youngsters are pretty imaginative. <laughs> Suppose you were ever to commit suicide, would you leave a suicide note? Now I ask you, if somebody had given you such a questionnaire, what, you would, what would you do with such a questionnaire? Would you fill it out? What would you think of the person who gave it to you? You think it was sick or weird or something? Certainly not sane, certainly not, you know. Well, I, you know, but so far in all of the reports of teenage suicide, I've seen no mention of death education courses or no call for an investigation in the teaching of such courses. Why not? They've been around now quite a while, and if they were any good, why are more youngsters committing suicide? In fact, what they now do is when they have a rash of suicides in a school district, they import all of these behavioral psychologists, all these secular humanist psychologists who tell them about, you know, self-actualization and, you know, how they've got, you know, they should live for themselves and life is worth living. God knows what else they tell them, but uh, they talk a lot about suicide. They make the children very suicide conscious, suicide aware. I believe when I was going to junior high school, I, I, I barely even thought of the subject. I don't think I even heard of suicide until I was well advanced in years. It was nothing I thought about. But certainly when you believe in God and believe that your life is a precious gift, you're, you don't think of suicide. But when you believe that you're a nothing, that you're just a you know, a product of, of chance in a world that has no meaning, then maybe you do look at life in a strange, in, in a depressing way. But in any case, I was very curious to find out where did all of this death, death education come from? So I began going through my files. I keep lots of clippings. I clip newspapers for years. And, you know, occasionally they, they come in handy. Well, Going through my files, I found an article from the Boston Herald American of November 4th, 1977, describing a death education course given to fifth graders in a Boston suburban school. Well, this was eight years ago. As part of the course, the children were taken to a nearby cemetery. The article states, Nine-year-old Alan Offenberg, Robert Jost, and Chris Reva grabbed everyone's attention as they jumped up and down on the 200-year-old grave of Peter Salem, one of Framingham's founding fathers. Hey, they shouted. Hey, you can hear the coffin vibrating underground. 
Listen, it's rattling. Unquote. Well, I, I imagine that's a rather innocent way to get the kids into death education. You take them on a little field trip to a local cemetery with historical gravestones and have them jump up and down on a few graves. That seems like a rather innocent thing. But then the article goes on, quote, the fifth grade lessons in death at Framingham's Roosevelt School are a small part in a growing movement in death education. As a result, in the past five years, the Massachusetts Department of Education has introduced a correspondence course on death. Can you imagine who would take a correspondence course on death? Learning French, yes. <laughs> the University of Massachusetts in Boston has initiated a course called Death and Dying. Brookline High School has inserted units on coping with loss and grief in its psychology curriculum. And Bigelow Junior High School in Newton has included a session on dying in English courses, to name a few. You see, they get them into all these different courses. In the elementary school, the children are asked to define death and draw a picture of it. As the course progresses, the children also will learn what their teachers call the basics of writing their own wills, epitaphs, and eulogies, and enacting a death scene. They'll see a film about a girl their own age who dies. At the last class, they'll visit a funeral home where they'll learn how a body is prepared and dressed for a wake, how a coffin is lowered into the ground, and how long it takes for a body to disintegrate." Unquote. Now, after my talk in Indianapolis, a woman came up to me and she told me that when she was in senior high school 10 years ago, when she was in senior high school, her teacher had given the class the assignment of writing out their plans for their own funerals. You know, who they would invite, what kind of music they would play, uh, what kind of a speech would be given at their funeral. Another woman came up to me and told me that her daughter had been taken to a funeral home and had actually watched the undertaker embalm a corpse. Another mother told me that her son in his class had been required to build a model coffin. And I've heard of instances where children in visiting the undertaking establishment even try out coffins, you know, to see if they're comfortable. But that's the kind of morbid, grotesque, sick kind of things that are going on in your public schools and you are paying for it. You see, death education is not cheap. Very expensive. They need specially trained teachers. You know, you're paying for their training, believe it or not. Now, the article I just read to you was written in 1977. By now, such courses are probably taught in every school district in America. The public schools are forbidden from teaching about the living God through whom eternal life is attainable, but they can teach the secular humanist view on death. See, the humanists believe that once life is over, that's it. There is no eternity. Who is pushing all this death education? The answer can be found in the Boston Herald American of July 23, 1978, in an article about Professor Richard O. Eulen of the University of Massachusetts and author of Death and Dying Education. The book includes an 18-week syllabus for the death education teacher. The article states, quote, at the time Professor Eulen began doing reading and research, the National Education Association, the publisher of the book, was looking for someone to write about death education. A friend who had heard about the NEA's quest matched the author with the publisher." Unquote. So there you have it. The NEA goes out and commissions a professor to write a textbook on death education to be used throughout the public schools of America. Now I ask you, what business is it of a teacher's union to commission a professor to write a book on death education and to insert it in the curriculum of all the schools of America. Who gave them that mandate? Are parents of America clamoring for death education? 
I think the parents of America would like their children to be taught to read and write. That's right. But instead, they're getting death education. Oh, and they're taking special pains to make sure that they get the proper kind of death education. You know, they learn all about suicide and how to commit suicide. But there was the unfortunate incident in Bloomington, Indiana, not too long ago. I was spoke there, and I was given a little clipping about what had happened there, where a youngster committed suicide by turning on the automobile engine in the garage, the, the family garage. He killed himself by carbon monoxide, but he also accidentally happened to kill his mother and father who were in the other part of the house because the fumes, the carbon monoxide fumes, went into the rest of the house. So he not only managed to kill himself, but he killed his mother and father. And I would attribute that to very poor death education uh, instruction. I mean, after all, the teacher should have told him that if he intended to kill himself with carbon monoxide, he should seal the doors and windows to make sure that none of the lethal gas got into the rest of the house. So they're not even good at teaching death education. They're not terribly efficient at it. So death education has been around since the mid-1970s, just about the time that teenage suicides began to increase. In 1958, the U.S. Bureau of Vital Statistics listed only three childhood suicides. Only three in 1958, and now in 1985 we have 6,000. Today, it is the second highest cause of death among teenagers. Death education isn't preventing suicide. It is making it more acceptable, like abortion, premarital sex, functional illiteracy, hallucinogenic drugs. The absence of religion in the public schools creates a spiritual vacuum in which Satan can enter and thrive. If children are not given the moral armament with which to defend themselves against evil, the very worst can happen. Here's an illustration from the New York Times of July 8, 1984, approximately a year ago. Quote, a teenage youth charged with slaying and mutilating a 17-year-old Long Island boy in what authorities said was a ritual carried out before followers of a satanic cult was found hanged early yesterday in his cell at the Suffolk County Jail. The sheriff ordered that a second youth charged in the case be placed under a 24-hour suicide watch. The suspect's death was the latest development in the murder of Gary Lawers of East Northport, who vanished June 15th. According to what the authorities said were confessions by the two suspects, Mr. Lawers was stabbed repeatedly and had his eyes gouged out in a four-hour ritual in the light of a campfire in a wooded area near Northport on the night of June 16th. Northport, incidentally, is one of those beautiful affluent suburbs on the north shore of Long Island. The cult is known as the Knights of the Black Circle. It has about 20 teenage members and has held gatherings for several years in the Northport area involving the sacrifice of animals the burning and torturing of animals in satanic rituals. Incidentally, when I was speaking in Akron, Ohio, I happened to watch the 6 o'clock news, and the lead story that night was the discovery of mutilated animals in the area and of satanic graffiti on walls and sidewalks in the Akron area, indicating that there were some satanic cults at work in that part of the country. Mayor Peter J. Nolan like many Northport residents, said yesterday that he found the murder and the suicide hard to believe. He said the village of Neat Homes on tree-lined streets had many recreation and aid programs for young people, including a drug rehabilitation center supported by the local school district. We have everything a kid wants, he said. When arrested Thursday, Mr. Casso, the suspect who committed suicide, was wearing a shirt bearing a devil's picture and the logo of ACDC, a popular heavy metal rock group with a satanic image whose rendition of Hell's Bells on an album entitled Back in Black proclaims Satan will get you and you're only young but you're gonna die. 
At least four teenagers witnessed the slaying in which Mr. Casso plunged a knife 17 times into the head, neck, and chest of the victim. During the ritual, some of the victim's clothing was burned as the cult members chanted, and the dying victim was forced to say, I love Satan. Casso then dragged the victim about 15 yards, thinking he was dead. When Casso began to leave the site, Law was sat up, and according to Casso, said, I love you, Mom. At this point, Casso returned to where Law was sat and inflicted further stab wounds into the facial area, cutting out his eyes. Simultaneously, Casso reportedly told the police he heard a crow screech, and this was indication to him as a Satan worshiper that the devil had ordered him to kill Lawless, unquote. Well, what I just read to you is, is not something that took, pl that took place in the, in the darkest recesses of, of the jungles of South America or something which occurred in, in, in Africa somewhere. This occurred in the most affluent, technologically advanced society in all of human history. We're supposed to be scientifically oriented. We're supposed to have gotten rid of all this superstition and, and these crazy notions about Satan and the devil and all of that, and of God, naturally. The humanists consider God a superstition. But apparently, these young people believe that Satan exists. They're worshiping him. As a matter of fact, what's happened in our, in our country is that there is a, a growth of satanic cults. In fact, when I was in Seattle not too long ago, Reverend Rush Dooney told us, he said there's been a great breakthrough in the, uh, in the medium. He says they're beginning to admit that Satanism exists, that there are satanic cults in the United States. And he was referring to the show that was on, uh, I believe it was ABC, the 2020 show, in which they had a segment on, on Satanism, on, on satanic murders. And it turns out that these wonderful Satanists, all of whom have gone to public schools, no doubt, are now into cannibalism. It's no longer a matter of what they are eating, it is who are they eating? Who are they eating? People are disappearing in America. Are they winding up as human sacrifice for these, for some of these satanic cults? It's obvious that that's what's happening in America. So you see what happens, what the absence of God does, what the rejection of God does. It doesn't produce, you know, people free of superstition. It simply permits Satan to enter and thrive. So you can play ACDC satanic music in public schools, but hymns to Jesus Christ are strictly forbidden. In fact, America's public schools are owned by Satan. And that's why there's an invisible sign on every public school in America that tells Jesus Christ to keep out. They belong to Satan. He doesn't want Christ in his schools. They are Satan's parochial schools, and he loves death education because he wants the souls of our youth. What with drugs, rock music, pornography, sensitivity training, values clarification, blasphemy, foul language, sexual promiscuity, globalism, socialism, witchcraft, astrology, yoga, transcendental meditation, and whatever else you want to add, our public schools have become a moral cesspool, leading our youth to degeneracy and degradation. Is that what we're paying our taxes for? You know, you're paying for all of that. You're paying for it. It's not free. It would be different if it was some little private school somewhere doing it. But you are paying for all of this. And they are, and the educators, the NEA and the secular humans are getting away with it all. But they wouldn't be able to do it for two minutes if the Christians of America withdrew their financial support of public education. 
The impact of satanic education on the youth of our inner cities is even more frightful than in the suburbs. You think it's bad in the suburbs, well, you hear about the inner cities. In the inner cities, there is less suicide, but more murder. The Detroit Free Press of November 11th, 1984, devoted two full pages to the shootings in Detroit among young blacks from July 1st, 1984 through November 10th of that year. And I happened to be in Detroit at the time, and it was a Sunday, and I opened up the newspaper, and there was this two-page spread, pictures, chronological account of every single uh, shooting that had taken place in the Detroit inner city. In those four and a half months, 118 children under 17 were shot in Detroit. Two of them twice. Eight died. 100 of them were male and all but four were black. Among black youth today, unemployment is as high as 75% in some areas. The situation has become explosive. These youths have all gone to our wonderful public schools which somehow failed to teach them any employable skills. Pray tell, what were they doing for eight to 12 years in the schools? Just warming the seats at great expense to the taxpayer? Do you know that they come out of school without any employable skills? I live in Boston where there are so many cries for help wanted. They can't fill the jobs because they can't hire these young people because they don't have the skills. They can't read, they can't write, they can't even speak well. How can you hire them? Even if you want to, you can't. Imagine that. We're paying for it all. We've paid for that. The New York Times Magazine of September 16, 1984 carried a truly ominous article on black youth entitled Man-Child in Harlem, written by black journalist Claude Brown. Mr. Brown writes, quote, Today's man-child is a teenager between the ages of 13 and 18, living with his unskilled laboring mother and three or four sisters and brothers in a dilapidated tenement or low-income project. Of course, the, the unskilled mother is also a product of public education. Today's man-child is persistently violent, obsessed with a desperate need for pocket money. They possess an uncompromising need to be able to wear a different pair of designer jeans twice a week. Man-Child 1984 is the product of a society so rife with violence that killing a mugging or robbery victim is not fashionable. You take their stuff and you pop it. If you pop is the new word for murder. Bang, bang, pop. You take their stuff and you pop them. Murder is in style now. The new man child is so deadly and so cynically rational that he is terrifying. It is disturbing to consider that murder is in style among young muggers and that the style among the New York political establishment is anti-capital punishment liberalism and how well the two styles complement each other. Today's man child obtains the biggest gun he can find, usually a sawed-off shotgun with a 45 sticks it in the face of some poor working person and takes all of five or ten dollars and his life. A maniacal act, unquote. You see, in the old days, they used to rob you and they'd let you go so that they could rob you two weeks later when you got a uh, statement. He said that separation from God leads to insanity. And these youngsters have all gone to public schools where they've been told that there is no God, that they are animals, there is no hope, they have no employable skills, there's no purpose to life, and they are becoming killers. And of course, they're not sentenced to death, you know, uh, the liberals want to keep all of these killers alive. Why do they want to keep all these killers alive? You know why? Because they are grooming the black community in this country to become the purveyors of violent revolution. You see, in a communist revolution, there's a point at which violence must take place, where the anti-communists, where the resistors must be killed off. And you've got to have a large reservoir of killers available. And we've trained them. They're there. They're unemployed in many black communities in the cities of America. 
waiting to be used. Hopefully they never will be used. Hopefully we'll stop this thing before they can be used. But obviously there's method. There is method to this whole social phenomenon and development. So do you wonder why Mr. Bernard Jett shot those four black youths in the New York subway when they tried to rob him? You know, it was four against one. What was he supposed to do? Answer the social security numbers? <laughs> Do you wonder why he bought a gun to defend himself against these homicidal maniacs who roam freely through the subways of New York looking for victims? Remember, these youths are the products of American public education. We have compulsory school attendance laws in every state of the Union. And these youths are exactly what the schools have programmed them to be. Incidentally, talking about compulsory school attendance laws, the NEA wants to lower the age for compulsory attendance. They want to begin getting kids into the schools at three, age three. They're doing it, you know, slowly. They tried five, the age of five in Massachusetts, but somehow the citizens didn't particularly care for that. But I believe in some states they're, being, uh, they're, they're getting it down to five. They want to lower it so that they can get the kids earlier. So they can really do a job on them. You see, you see, because too many of the kids, by the time they get to school at six years old, they've got too many uh, religious values in their lives. So they want to get them earlier. But uh, the schools, <clears throat> these youths are exactly what the schools have programmed them to be. In the first place, they are functionally illiterate. And it is our schools that have made them that way. Ever since John Dewey and his progressive colleagues took control of public education in the early part of the century, the goal of public education has been to create a socialist society in America. John Dewey considered high literacy to be an obstacle to socialism. And that is why the progressives shifted the emphasis away from basic intellectual skills to the development of social skills. High literacy produced this individualistic intelligence, which was not conducive to socialist control. The progressives wanted to dumb down the masses so that they could be controlled by a new scientific technological elite from the universities and psych labs. So the educators changed the way Americans were taught, taught to read. They threw out the alphabetic phonics method of teaching reading and substituted a new sight word or whole word method based on reflex conditioning that would produce a much lower level of literacy. All of this occurred in the early 1930s. You see, these pro progressive uh, educators faced a very difficult problem. They had to give the impression of educating Americans for keeping them in school for longer periods of time they had to give the impression that these children were learning something while at the same time lowering their literacy level and dumbing them down. Well, how were they to do that? Well, these were the top psychologists of the time. These were the men who were giving out PhDs to all the other psychologists. They were in positions of power, and they decided the easiest way to do this would be to change the way you teach children to read. You see, the the proper method of teaching children to read an alphabetic language is by alphabetic phonics. That is, you teach children the alphabet and you teach the sounds that the letters stand for. Because the letters of the alphabet stand for sound. That's what an alphabet is. It's a set of symbols that stand for the irreducible speech sounds of a language. And you cannot learn to speak that language. You cannot learn to read it unless you learn those letters and their sounds. For example, suppose you wanted to learn Russian. You'd have to learn the Cyrillic alphabet first. And you would study all the Cyr Cyrillic letters, and you would know what sounds they stand for. And then you would read two-letter Russian words, then three-letter Russian words, and then uh, longer words. And before you know it, you'd be able to read Russian. You might not understand what you're reading, but at least you could read it. You'd be able to pronounce it. You see, so that's what the alphabet does. It permits you to pronounce the language. And then it's the pronunciation, it's the speaking of the language that recalls 
the ideas that it refers to, or the actions, or the objects. It's the spoken language that we refer to. Now, what the professors did, these great psychologists did, they decided to teach American children to read English as if it were Chinese. To look at each little written English word as if it were a little picture. Not a combination of letters that stand for sounds, but simply a little picture, a bunch of squigglies without any particular meaning, arbitrarily arranged. Because you know that the letters, the alphabetic letters, are arranged in a specific sequence, the sequence in which the sounds are uttered. But to a youngster who is taught to read by look, say, or by the sight method, he doesn't know why the letters are arranged in that particular sequence. That's why they misspell so badly. They can't understand why such, so much fuss is made over the proper sequence of the letters, because why should it matter since they, they have to look at it as a little picture? So what the professors did was they reverted back to an earlier form of writing. You see, the earliest form of writing that human beings used was, was pictography. And you've seen pictography in the cave dwellings, you know, pictures of, of the way the cavemen drew. They drew pictures of animals, of, of, of people, of things. And you didn't have to go to school to read that because the pictures resembled what they were representing. And we use pictography today. You find it uh, used in airports extensively. All kinds of little pictures now. You know, like they have uh, for the men's room, they have uh, somebody in pants. And for the ladies' room, they have somebody with a dress. But one of these days, a lady with slacks is going to go into the men's room. <laughs> but that's supposed to be a substitute. You know, if, if it simply said men and women, they would know that, well, you go into this room. Men is in this room, but you know, with the little pictures, it becomes a little confusing. Well, in any case, pictography was the earliest form of writing. But as civilization got much more complex, complicated, uh, it was impossible to draw pictures of ideas and things that resembled the ideas and abstractions they were representing. For example, how would you draw a picture of method, a picture of level? a picture of low, or a picture of high, a, a picture of much, a picture of use. You see, so they had to invent all kinds of little symbols that didn't look like anything they represented. And so the only way you could learn these thousands and thousands of symbols was to be taught them by somebody who said, this means low, or this means high, and of course it was a, a, it was a, a method of memorization. And the Chinese today have to memorize 5,000 different symbols before they can read a Chinese newspaper. But then somebody said, let's get rid of this horrible ideographic system, idiotic ideographic system. And he was somebody who knew, who had, or somebody had made the great discovery that all of spoken language, everything we say, is composed of a small number of irreducible speech sounds. For example, we have approximately a million words in the English vocabulary, and do you know how many irreducible speech sounds there are in English? There are only 44. So in other words, our million words are, consists of combinations of those 44 sounds, different combinations, endless variety of combinations. And so in order, he said, why not invent a set of symbols to stand for the speech sounds of the language? Then we could transcribe spoken language into a written form and easily translated back into spoken form. And that was the genesis of the alphabetic writing system. It was the greatest invention in human history. It did to the ancient world what the computer is doing to our world. It speeded up things. And immediately, hieroglyphics was discarded. And the Western world went for the alphabet. And what's very significant is one of the first works created by alphabetic writing, one of the first works to appear, was the scripture. Isn't that amazing? And, that's, and that is why many people believe, many sages believe, that the alphabet was of divine inspiration because it was, it was God's time to reveal his word to the human race. And so the alphabet, by happenstance, was invented. We don't know who invented it, but it was invented. And it permitted the Word of God to be put in printed form. And you know the Word of God has to be very accurate. 
it cannot be inaccurate, it cannot be uh, ideographs which are interpreted by language but which do not directly represent language. To give you an idea of how inaccurate ideographs can be, can be, they use them now in automobiles. I was riding in a Mercedes the other day that had little buttons with all little kinds of pictures on them. I didn't know whether it was the windshield wiper or the, or the, or the washer or whether it opened windows or closed them. You had to press all the buttons before you found out what they did. These little pictures don't mean, these little ideographs don't mean a thing until you try them. And, and so they're a highly inaccurate form of, 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 uh, of reading. And yet our children have been taught to read English as if they were, uh, each word was an ideograph. And the result is that most of our, uh, the, our functional illiterates can't read above a third grade level. And then many of our so-called good readers read inaccurately. They leave out words that are on the page. They put in words that are not there. They guess the words that they cannot recognize. I've, I've trained such young, I've, I've retrained them. I do that kind of tutoring, and so I know what kind of symptoms they have, and it's devilish trying to get them to, to undo the horrible habits that have been formed by the, uh, by the look-say method. They use, the way they get these kids conditioned at that early age, at six years old, as they use Pavlovian conditioning on them. To prove it to you, let me read to you what Professor Walter Dearborn of Harvard University, how he described the look-say method in 1940 in an article. He wrote, the principle which we have used to explain the acquisition of a sight vocabulary, and a sight vocabulary, which is the heart of the look-say method, is learning a list of words without knowing what the letters stand for. That's a sight vocabulary, and they teach it virtually in all the schools in America. He says, the principle which we have used to explain the acquisition of a sight vocabulary is, of course, the one suggested by Pavlov's well-known experiments on the conditioned response. This is as it should be. The basic process involved in conditioning and in learning to read is the same. So what Professor Dearborn is telling us that we teach American children to read in American schools as if they were dogs, Pavlovian dogs. Now I will submit that there is a bit of a difference between a child and a dog. I know the professors don't think so, but I do, and I'll tell you why. You see, a child comes to school with a speaking vocabulary at the age of six of between 5,000 and 35,000 words. Can you believe it? This little youngster beginning at the age of two, begins teaching himself to speak his own language. And by the time he gets to school, he has learned anywhere from 5,000 to 35,000 words, all by himself, without the help of Sesame Street, without the help of cartoons and balloons and all the other paraphernalia that they heap on children in the schools. So he's a very intelligent young human being very intelligent individual, full of learning energy. He is a self-learner, a dynamic dynamo of a self-learner, and he comes to school and he's going to be taught to read. He believes that now he's going to expand his vocabulary or he's going to learn the secrets of the, of the printed page. And what is he given to read? What do they give him to read in the schools? Well, I will read to you what they were giving back in the days when they had Dick and Jane something, and this, will, I'm sure, will uh, be rather nostalgic to some of you. They give him such, such literary gems as the following. Quote, Dick, look, Jane, look, look, see Dick, see, see, oh, see, see Dick, oh, see Dick, oh, 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 funny, funny Dick. Now, the youngster who is confronted with that in... in at the first grade, he says to himself, either I'm crazy or she's crazy. <laughs> because this little youngster knows that that's not the way people talk. I mean, he's mastered the, his auditory and verbal skills to the point where he is a dynamo of learning. You're telling him that people talk this way. He knows that, there's, that they don't talk this way. And he begins to think, this school business is rather weird. But 
Mommy sends me here. Daddy tells me to obey the teacher. And the teacher is teaching me this stuff, so there must be something to it. So he obediently tries to learn to read via this preposterous uh, method. So what happens? He doesn't do too well at it. At least a third of the students you know fail. So by the end of the first year, this little intelligent youngster who thought he was the end all and be all of, of intelligence finds out that he's got a reading problem. And then his mother is informed that he'll have to stay behind a year. And then in the second grade, his parents are told, Johnny has a learning disability. In fact, Johnny is dyslexic. And then by the time he gets to the third grade, his mother is told, Johnny may even have minimal brain damage. So by this time, Johnny is a real mess. And his mother is further told, you know, your son is not as smart as he thinks he is. He really is dumb. Dumb, dumb, dumb. This has happened to millions of children in America. Millions of children have suffered this whole process and have to live with it for the rest of their lives. Some of them recover. Some of, the, uh, 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 some of them manage to regain their self-esteem through other means they compensate. Others are ruined. Others are totally ruined. Some of them go into drugs because, you see, they want to expand their minds. And they don't know how to read. And, of course, reading is the only way you can expand your mind because expanding your mind means expanding your vocabulary, expanding your ability to handle ideas. So they take to drugs because they're told, well, this is mind expanding. So they go into LSD and all of that rot. <coughs> And then Johnny, at the, at the uh, third grade, he's got all this learning energy, but it can't get anywhere because it's being bottled up by this look-same method. So what happens? He becomes hyperactive. And then his mother is told, we don't know what to do with Johnny. If you want to keep him in school, we're going to have to drug him, give him pills. And so they begin to give him pills. And so by the time he gets to the fourth grade, Johnny is a first-class zombie. So that's what happens to youngsters in our schools. The progressives were so successful in getting phonics out of the schools that by 1944, dyslexia had become a household word and millions of children were having problems learning to read. In April 1944, Life magazine published an article on dyslexia. And even the editors of Life magazine didn't know what was wrong with the children. So they attributed the causes to causes of reading disability to glandular imbalance, heart disease, eye or ear trouble, or from a deep-seated psychological disturbance that blocks a child's ability to learn. Oh, the educators must have been, you know, having a ball with this one. The article then described the treatment given a young girl afflicted with dyslexia. Thyroid treatments, removal of tonsils and adenoids, exercises to strengthen her eye muscles. Nowhere did they recommend teaching her the alphabet. So that's the kind of thing they were doing in the 40s. You know, and, and the, the business of putting a label on a child, learning disabled. Here's a youngster who's taught himself to speak his own language. He's not learning disabled. He's the most learning abled youngster around. But he's been made, deliberately made, learning disabled by a school system that is cynically destroying the minds of the young people of this country. Well, that's the way things were until 1955 when Rudolf Flesch wrote his famous book by Johnny Can't Read. All the way up in, until then, the, the professors were laughing all the way to the bank. They were making millions, and they still are, on these textbooks. They were writing the textbooks. But Rudolf Flesch in 1955 blew the whistle. He said, uh, there's nothing wrong with American children. They haven't suddenly been born with all these birth defects. What was wrong was the teaching method, the look-say method. He exposed it completely in, the, in his book. And that's why that book is so important. It's a milestone. The first man to, to reveal to the American public exactly what was being done to the children of America. 
Well, what do you think the reaction of the professors were? They were absolutely furious, enraged. Why? Because he made them appear stupid. He told them, in effect, he said, look, you guys, don't you know phonics works better than looks say? And he produced a whole, a whole bunch of studies to prove that phonics, you know, you learn to read better with phonics. But uh, the professors were furious because they knew that. He wasn't telling them anything they didn't know. They were furious because he was making them look like fools in public. He was ridiculing them. And so they turned the entire teaching profession against him. And then they proceeded to create the reading reform. Uh, they created the International Reading Association, which is the largest professional organization that deals with elementary education. All elementary school teachers virtually belong to the International Reading Association, and that's where they get all of their information on how to teach reading. And today, they no longer call it the look-say method. They call it psycholinguistics. See, they want to they want to confuse the parents. They figured, uh-oh, Rudolf Flesch had identified the cause as look-say. Well, we'll change it. We'll call it psycholinguistics, and then what will they say about that? So that's what they've done. Well, the educators have done quite a job on us academically, deceiving the public, the parents, and the children. The American taxpayer has been robbed blind by the educators to finance his own intellectual destruction. He's actually paying the educators to destroy literacy, the free enterprise system, individualism, religion, and our unalienable rights as human beings. After hearing all of this, you must be wondering what kind of men would deliberately devise a plot of such diabolical evil to destroy the minds and souls of our youth. I believe that John Dewey, James McKean Cattell, Charles Judd, Edward L. Thorndike, and others of whom I write in my book, I believe that these men were basically Satanists, driven by a hatred of God so deep that they were willing to spend their lives doing everything in their power to turn the American people against them. Now, why do I use a term like Satanist? I don't use it lightly. I believe they were Satanists because they all came from good Christian homes. Some of them came from homes in which their father was a minister. Uh, John Dewey, in fact, taught Sunday school as a youth. So they knew their own religion. They knew Christianity. They knew the Bible. They knew the Bible very well. But when they became atheists and socialists and progressives, they spent all of their professional life doing everything in their power to destroy the Christian religion, to destroy the traditional religion based on the Old and New Testaments, to destroy the work of Jesus Christ, and to substitute in its place a new religion called secular humanism. And when you spend all of your life trying to destroy the true religion, I believe you are working for Satan. And that is why today's educators are putting up so strong a fight against school prayer, creationism, or even equal access. They would, you know, and it's interesting, they won't even give Christians a minute of, of uh, silent prayer. Of course, Christians would be a fool for accepting a minute of silent prayer, you know, giving, they, you know, they'd get their minute of silent prayer, shout hallelujah, and go back to sleep. And then, of course, they'd be giving five hours and 59 minutes to the devil. That's not much of a bargain. But you see, the humanists won't give Christians a minute of silent prayer. You know why? They don't have to. They don't have to. Why should they give the Christians anything? If you see what they're doing in Iowa, for example, where they, they got rid of prayer at the, at, the, at the school graduation, they got rid of the benediction, court handed down a ruling, a Unitarian went to court and got them to stop uh, 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 the benediction of the graduation. They now have banned the Gideon Society from, from giving out Bibles in the schools, free Bibles to children, voluntarily. Was there any outcry on the part of the Christians in Iowa? I'm listening. Haven't heard a word. Unfortunately, the Christians in America are taking everything that the humanists dish out. So why should the humanists worry? Why should they worry? Whatever they do, they get away with in the public sector. Fortunately, there are Christians who are doing some work to counter this. I was on a wonderful television station the other night, which is doing tremendous work, and I hear that it's having quite an impact here in the Pittsburgh area. 
But their entire program, the program of the progressives, is calculated to turn this nation against God. The American educator has played a central role in turning the American public school into a temple of atheism, ignorance, and vice. There are, of course, many good teachers in our public schools trying to do some good in an environment of overwhelming sin. And I want to stress that, that there are many good Christian teachers. I've met them at my lectures. They've come to my lecture. They've introduced me on the platform. And so I know they exist. And they are very pleased with what I am doing because they say somebody had to say what is going on in these schools. But many of these good teachers are ready to quit. Humanism, socialism, and communism have one thing in common. That's why it doesn't matter whether John Dewey had a Communist Party card or not. They have one thing in common. They all share a burning hatred of God. This makes them allies in their determination to wipe out Judaism and Christianity. Hatred of God makes them all Satanists. For Satan's mission is to separate man from God by any means he can devise. Igor Shafarovich, the brilliant Soviet mathematician, writes in his book, The Socialist Phenomenon, and Shafarovich, by the way, has lived all of his life in the belly of the monster. He's lived all of his life in the communist system. His book is a very scholarly history of socialism, of how socialism has operated in different cultures and in different times in history. Uh, he's been fired from his job in, in the university in, in Russia, and uh, uh, his book, the, the Socialist Phenomenon, was published in the United States a couple of years ago. With it was smuggled out of Russia, translated into English, and published with an introduction by Solzhenitsyn. So it comes to us with the highest recommendation. He writes, "The death of mankind is not only a conceivable result of the triumph of socialism; it constitutes the goal of socialism." Do you hear that? The death of mankind is the goal of socialism. He continues, The complete extinction of mankind is not a chance external consequence of the embodiment of the socialist ideal. This impulse is a fundamental and organic part of socialist ideology. To a greater or lesser degree, it is consciously perceived as such by its partisans and even serves them as inspiration. Now that's a very profound insight, because haven't you often wondered why there are so many so-called idealists in this world willing to die to bring hell on earth, willing to die to bring the gulag system to the United States, willing to die to bring Stalinism to the world? Why are there so many people willing to die for Satan? Apparently there are there are more people willing to die for Satan than to live for Christ. Because when you live for Christ, at least you stand up and you resist satanic forces. But what, but what uh, Shafarovich is telling us is that socialism, communism, and humanism are cults of racial suicide. No wonder so much talk of nuclear holocaust by the humanists and communists. Have you noticed? The last three decades we've been told that we're living on the brink of nuclear self-annihilation. The human race is about to ex extinguish itself. Of course, who has placed that sword of Damocles over our head? The communists. We got rid of our nuclear weapons at the end of World War II, but then the Russians got the uh, atomic secrets and proceeded to build a nuclear arsenal that has threatened the, the free world <coughs> since then. And so we live with this this danger of nuclear extinction. And I'm sure that many of you saw that film of, of the uh, day after, produced by the liberals at ABC. What was the purpose of that film? Well, to scare the American people to death, you know, to get us to surrender now or, or you know, better red than dead, that sort of thing. But it's very interesting. It seems to have had a, a, an entirely different impact on the American people. After the American people saw that film, I didn't see it. I was in a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> I refuse to have my emotions manipulated by those sick liberals at ABC. I had better things to do with my family.
you know what the American people did after seeing that film? They went out to their nearest automobile dealers, their nearest Sears store. They bought the biggest cars, the biggest refrigerators, and washing machines, all on credit. <laughs> you know, they figured they wouldn't have to pay for it. <laughs> and they also f figured, well, if we have to go, we might as well go on a Cadillac. <laughs> so that's why you suddenly had the automobile industry surge. Detroit was so happy and consumer credit, uh, you know, soared, and nobody knew why. Well, that probably was, it stimulated the economy. But no wonder Jim Jones staged a mass suicide of himself and his followers. And there in the Jim Jones episode, you see a microcosm of communism at work. Line up everybody, give them their cyanide, and when everybody has killed, them, uh, has killed themselves, men, women, and children, then the leaders kill themselves. But they make sure that everyone else is killed first because they don't want anyone to survive. And you had something like that also in, in Germany at the end of World War II when Hitler, who decided that the German people weren't worthy of survival if they couldn't win that war. So he, he, he proceeded to let Germany be pulverized, utterly destroyed, and then at the very end when the Russians were practically at the door of his bunker, he shot himself and his, and his wife and then Goebbels gave cyanide to him, his wife and children, and then also took cyanide himself. And they all died in this orgy of self-destruction. No wonder Pol Pot killed off half the Cambodian nation in one year. You remember Jane Fonda telling us what wonderful people these communists were? That if only we would give them power, they would be so wonderful. They would bring, you know, heaven on earth in, 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 uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. And so what happened, the people decided, well, we'll take a chance. Let's give Pol Pot power. Maybe it'll stop the killing. Well, what it did was the killing just started when Pol Pot took over. And, and what happened in, in Cambodia is what happens when communists have unrestrained total power. They kill everyone they can get their hands on. And they killed off half their own people in, in, the, in the space of a year. Those nice Jane Fonda's friends. <laughs> And no wonder the humanists are pushing death education in the schools of America. See, they want to give American youth a head start in suicide. 6,000 this year, not 84, I don't know how many in 85. And you've heard of head start, follow through? Well, that's their version of it. But you can see what it's doing to the minds of these youngsters, and they're increasing this talk of suicide in the schools all over the place. And no wonder we have killed over 15 million unborn babies in this country. That's a form of national suicide. After all, when you're killing off the future, you're killing off the future generation, that's pretty serious business. We don't know what we've lost. We don't know how many geniuses were lost, how many great men and women were lost in that Holocaust. And do you think that Gloria Steinem has a sleepless night over it? Do you think that she worries about the deaths of 15 million Children, that shows you how merciful the humanists are. That shows you what you can expect from them should they take power. They are merciless. They gloat over the fact that they've been able to kill 15 million unborn children. They think that's great. They want to kill more. They haven't had enough. And they fight us every bit of the way. Shafarovich writes, quote, understanding socialism as one of the manifestations of the allure of death explains its hostility toward individuality, its desire to destroy those forces which support and strengthen human personality, religion, culture, family, individual property. It is consistent with the tendency to reduce man to the level of a cog in the state mechanism, and also consistent with the tendency to reduce man to the level of of animal. Well, where does this suicidal impulse come from? Shafarovich calls it the allure of death. Sigmund Freud called it the death wish. You remember the death wish? Now, Freud, of course, lived in Europe. He saw the rise of Nazism in, in, in the most cultivated country in Europe, Germany, with its museums and universities and symphony orchestras and opera houses. And the minute the Germans discarded God, the minute they rejected God 
and reverted back to their pre-Christian paganism, they became barbarians. Barbarians. They created the 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 Mendelas, the Mengalas, that is the Mengalas, and the others of them.